All right, it's the top of the hour. Let's begin and let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and cat herder, and I'll be your guide to the next hour of conversation. And I'm very glad to see you all here. But before we begin, let me introduce the program. Uh, let me explain a bit about where it comes from, how it works, what we hope to do, and what our plan is for today. Uh, so to begin with, you should know the forum is in its fifth year. Uh, we've been running since 2016, uh, which is very, very exciting. If you're new to the forum, let me explain. This is a conversation-oriented space. This is a venue for discussing the future of higher education. We don't have presentations. Uh, we don't run as a standard webinar. Our whole idea is to focus on face-to-face -face audio and textual conversation. Now, every session, we tend to have one guest and one theme. And today you'll see is a little bit different because today we're going to continue our exploration of the COVID-19 pandemic and what it means for higher education's present and future. We are living in a truly extraordinary situation right now. Uh, this screenshot from the Johns Hopkins University Press, I'm sorry, the Johns Hopkins University uh, dashboard is already a bit out of date. Uh, we unfortunately crested more than half a million people infected with COVID-19. And already the impact on higher education is enormous. Now, I have been putting together some resources to help with that, uh, including uh, this forum. But let me just give you this URL if you'd like. Uh, these are links to a few different projects, including resources for tracking COVID-19, uh, our spreadsheet of campus closures and moving online, and more. Now, a bit more background about the Future Trends Forum, how it works. So to begin with, we can only do this work with the help of some very generous and kind sponsors. And I want to thank them before we proceed. Uh, from New York State, we thank NYSERNet. Uh, that's a non-for-profit that helps that state's college and universities do great things with each other and broadband internet. <clears throat> they also do good things for uh, professional development. And we're very pleased that they can help us. We're also grateful to Shindig because as you can see, they make this technology available that we're using. So if you're new to it, if you haven't been here for a while, let me explain how it works. Where I am right now and where this slide is, just for a moment, uh, is called the stage. And we call it the stage because everybody can see and hear everything that goes on on the stage. Think of it as the stage or the podium uh, of a big lecture hall or a giant classroom. And right below us, you can see around you a bunch of different icons. Each represents one or more people signing in from somewhere in the world. Some of them are video, so you can see a person's picture and their movement. Some of them are static photos, but they represent people signing in from somewhere. Now, if you'd like to talk to one of them privately on a one-to-one -one basis, kind of like leaning over and whispering to them, just double-click on their icon. If they want to talk to you, your two icons will click together like Legos, and you can have your own private audiovisual bubble. But I mentioned this is all about conversation, so let me show you how you can participate in that conversation. There are two major ways. The bottom of the screen, you'll see a few different buttons. One of them is a raised hand icon. The other one is a question mark. Now, click the raised hand if you want to join us here, here on stage. That is, if your microphone is working and your camera is working, your broadband is good enough, click that button. When the time is right, I'll beam you up on stage and you can join us for a conversation. It's really easy and fast to do. Now, if you can't do that, if your microphone doesn't work, for example, or you're in a crowded environment and can't talk out loud, that's okay. Click the question mark, and that gives you a little box into which you can type a comment or a question. When the time is right, I'll flash that on the screen for everyone to see, and I'll read it out loud for everyone to hear. Now, if that's not enough, if you're on Twitter, just use the hashtag FTTE, and I'll be tracking that during the course of our conversation, and I'll look to see what kind of comments or questions people have there. But really, click that raised hand so you can join us on stage so you can take advantage of the full affordance of the technology. And click the question mark if you really want to ask a question, but your machine won't let you do that. We're really grateful to Shindig for making this technology available. Now, we're also grateful to our supporters on Patreon. Uh, if you're new to Patreon, that's a crowdfunding site like Kickstarter or GoFundMe. Uh, it lets you collaboratively fund some ongoing project. 
In this case, it's our project of looking at the future of education. So if you just go to patreon.com slash Brian Alexander, you can see people contributing as little as a buck a month just to keep all the lights on, the machines humming happily. And I just want to make sure I can thank some of the really great people who've been very generous here. Um, this, you know, People like uh, Tom Hames, Melissa Wu, Kristen Eshelman, Seth Goodman, Corey, Michael Huggins, great folks. And you can join them. And we're really grateful to them for their support. Now, we're also grateful to some other people for their help because today is a really, really nice venture, a new venture for us. Uh, we are partnering with Campus Technology Magazine uh, in order to share this session today. Um, Campus Technology is a magazine I've been reading for years, I've written for, and I've uh, contributed to in different ways, and we're really, really grateful um, to join with them today. Uh, their editor, Rhea Kelly, is here, and she's going to join me as a co-host. In fact, I'm going to bring her up on stage right now. Rhea, hello. Hi. So thanks so much for having me. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with us, um, Campus Technology is a digital magazine. We're focused on all things technology in higher education, and um, particularly the intersection of technology and learning. Um, so we have been closely following the impact of coronavirus on colleges and universities. Um, I think one of the biggest issues that, that we're seeing is this tremendous effort going on to move courses online. Um, so we're doing our best to cover all of that news and, and the best practices that we can share in that area. Um, I also wanted to, to say I'm experiencing the move to remote learning myself as the parent of an eight-year-old. Um, our schools are closed, we're under shelter in place, we're social distancing, and it has been, I'll just say it's rocky. <laughs> um, so I definitely empathize with people who are on various sides and stages of this. It is not easy. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you and exchanging ideas on how technology can help. Well, thank you, Rhea. I really appreciate um, having you here. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to see the questions you come up with. And if your eight-year-old charges through those doors, that's okay. I, I think <laughs> it could happen, yep. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the purpose of today's session is to continue our exploration of COVID-19 and the future of education. And our focus today, not exclusively, but our main focus is going to be on the role of technology and what that does to help or hinder or otherwise contribute to this enormous, extraordinary event. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to open with a couple of comments and uh, a couple of questions, but then we'd really love to hear from all of you. We have some great folks in the audience, and I'd love to hear your stories. If you have a family at home, uh, like Rhea does and like I do, uh, if you've been teaching online, um, like I have been, or if you have any other stories about shifting a campus in any other way. Um, so um, again, if you'd like to contribute, uh, again, you can just click the uh, raised hand button to join us on stage, or you can click the question mark to type in a question. And before I even finish that sentence, Hands have been going up all over the place. So let me bring uh, a couple up right now. So let me welcome Baynard Bailey from Vassar. Baynard. Hi. Hello, everybody. Can you see me now? Oh, I can. I can. Oh, great. Oh, you can still see my towel. So you, I'm trying to close <laughs> off my frame here. I've been doing a lot of cleaning. <laughs> I, th I think you I think you hung up a bit there, Bernard. Um, Bananas, uh, in some ways. So um, at Vassar, uh, we had spring break. We're in the first week back from spring break. There's been a big push from the administration to just, oh, we'll just turn on Zoom, and now we'll have classes online. Job uh, complete. And I, I think we're skipping a whole uh, sort of instructional design and counseling and a human-centered approach where we really need to be saying, What's our best approach for everybody here, considering everyone's circumstances? And uh, I took my master's degree online, so I'm grateful that I had that experience because I know the standard is you know, a lot of readings, a, a, a couple of video lectures, maybe once in a while, mm -hmm. maybe an asynchronous, a synchronous component once a week if you're lucky. But most of it was done uh, completely asynchronously. So I feel like uh, 
everyone's feeling pressure to have all your meetings online. I've already, we're already starting to hear reports of Zoom fatigue. Uh, I've talked to people and they're like, you know, I'm in the meetings, I'm sitting in my chair all day long and I'm, you know, you're locked in on the camera. You have no place to go. And uh, we're, we're cheek to jowl in my house. We're uh, stacked on top of each other. I've got two kids and, you know, one is just engrossed in, uh, she's doing a, uh, what's the wind wind walker and uh, she's deep in that and mm. i had my first conversation with her in three days yesterday because i took half of the <laughs> off you know because she's just been gone and uh my older daughter's doing a little better because she's very active and we're exercising and walking so there's this analog component which is a really nice thing i just wish um i could just be focused on that but right now uh there's a lot of need and only so many people at our campus with the, the, the like, everyone is really doing a great job sort of helping in a hurry. But uh, I think the dust will settle in a week or two and we'll we'll think about some more contemplative and humored, human centered practices that will help us all get through this. But right now it's kind of like uh, yeah. a lot of very quick implementations of things and, uh, yeah. and, and everyone's kind of freaking out. That's my summary. I'm, I'm glad you were able to spare some time for us in the middle of all of that. <laughs> no, I was like, I got to I gotta talk to those guys again. I got to see what's happening out there. The connection. I'm such a social person, Brian. And I just feel like I've half my body's been cut off because I don't talk to the guy at the cert desk on the way into my workshop. I don't see... Uh, I don't see so many people that I would just be talking to all the time as part of my job, being connected to a, a high touch campus. And I'm going from being in a high touch campus to an absolutely no touch campus. So uh, for me personally, uh, it's very jarring and alienating. And I'm starting to develop my strategies to cope. I don't know if you noticed last week I was here, but I had my camera off because this was a disaster. Uh, so I'm trying to maintain a, a good professional presence and be as helpful as supportive as possible. But I'm also struggling to do those same things at home with my family. And uh, sometimes the institution is understanding and sometimes not. So it's it's a, a constant struggle to both support and counsel those that are engaged in this sort of rapid switch to online learning and also to support my own needs and the needs of my family in this situation. Well, that's an awful lot of work. Um, that's a lot of work. Red, did you did you want to ask Ben questions before he just disintegrates in front of our eyes? <laughs> yeah. Well, you mentioned Zoom fatigue, and I just wanted to see how you know it's. In the one hand, it's kind of our lifeline to see people face to face, but then mm. you know the there's the two sides of it. Mm. Um, do you have any more feelings on that? Uh, so in my general sense of things, you know, if you have a seminar that's based on discussion, that's okay in Zoom. And as long as you're like a smaller number of people, but if you're trying to do like a lecture or conversation with 30, 40, 50, 60 people, I think that the technology of it really starts to break down. I also think like the Zoom fatigue just becomes a factor. You know, if I turn my camera off and just listen, am I really there? Um, I. I think we're going to see the Zoom. The Zoom is really great. It really does do a great job, right? Because you can, it works in everything, and you can set up the meetings. Once it's working, it's does pretty good, um, and it's it's better than Skype. It's better than Google Hangouts. I love the shindig. Uh, I wish we had that, you know, for like a, a campus wide event or or something like that. And I think that's the next thing to sort and solve because we're dealing with this community group, and they're like we're making a one Google forum for everybody to talk to. Um, but I think we'll see less of, oh, let's just swap out all our class time with Zoom time, I hope, because that just seems exhausting. Because all the professors know, they're, I think everyone's working harder than ever now. Not We're not dialing it back, we're ramping it up. And we really need to just sort of like go, okay, we have five, six weeks in the semester. We, they, the administration's done a, jo a good job with the NRO option, so I think students can say, I'd like a B. If I don't get a B, give me a pass. And and that's a good way to sort of dial back the, the pressure and the expectations. Um, I think we'll also do the same thing. Once we settle into this, we're going to go, oh, Zoom is good at this. I'm not going to try to replace face-to-face, -face, all my face-to-face -face time with Zoom time because it does a, not a great job at that. But it does a good job with small meetings, uh, 
small groups, one-on-ones, uh, lecture-based sort of, oh, not lecture-based, discussion-based classes and, and human exchanges. Yeah. Well, we had a, a quick comment that came in from the uh, discussions. I just want to put this up on the screen for everyone to see. Um, and this is uh, from uh, uh, Temenik at the New School. Um, um, Zoom breakout rooms are really good for discussions or problem solving with large groups. Also, using the whiteboard and share screen, everyone can write and draw on the board. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Katayun. Can they all write and draw at the same time is one of my questions. I've, I've been experimenting with multiple devices and drawing with a whiteboard. I was wondering if anyone had tried that. That's a good question. Um, Katayun, if you have a, if you have a uh, quick answer for that. <laughs> Her answer came in seconds. She, yes, we just did today. Oh, that's awesome to know. I'll look for that feature. I'll make a, uh, a little note for myself on my many scraps of paper here that I have on my desk. Yeah. So look for Katia uh, in the new school. Um, Peter, thank you so much for coming. We're gonna, I'm gonna clear this. Yeah, my pleasure. Over. Thank you for hosting this and maintaining this routine despite all the chaos. My pleasure. And your room looks great. Thank you. I put a nice little thing in there to brighten it up. It works well. Uh, we have a few other folks who have their hands raised up, and so I just want to bring them up in a hurry. Um, we have Dave Ron from Cuyahoga College. I'm sorry, from Cuyahoga Community College. Hello, Dave. We need a we need your uh, camera on for that, or he might be having a bandwidth issue. Dave, uh, why don't you give us uh, why don't you just uh, reload your screen, Dave, um, and uh, and see if that clears things up. Uh, we also have uh, Thomas Hoover uh, from Louisiana Tech University. Tom, you're uh, you're muted. Thank you, Brian. Hi. Um, how are you doing? Well, great. Good to see you. Good, good to see you. Hey, Raya. Um, this has been really interesting. We actually started the Wednesday when this basically came down here was the first day of our quarter. So. Oh, wow. Um, so we didn't have the luxury of having a spring break or having any kind of anything. So I ironically had been meeting with Zoom on the Monday because we're doing some partnerships with K through 12. And I had a meeting set up for that Wednesday. I actually moved it to Tuesday. So we signed a PO with, uh, with Zoom on Wednesday. And uh, we that night got everything up and running. And we trained uh, 100 to 250 um I'm sorry, 150 to 200 faculty that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and went live on Monday on all of our classes on Zoom. Um, and I understand, you know, what you all are talking about as far as it doesn't meet everyone's needs. So I kind of look at it as I've got a whole bunch of different. I just simply look at it as another tool in the toolbox. We have media sites. So what we've trained our professors that if you would rather go ahead and record your lecture and have it so students can watch it before class and then discussion in class, then, then do that. If you would rather do the lecture and I mean, so I'm actually, we're actually using this as an opportunity to look at a hybrid approach. Um, and then at the same time, also just if some professors just wanna put their materials up there and have their, have their students go ahead and, and read or, or do dialogue or discussions in Moodle. Right. So, you know, we're kind of looking, looking at different options. And I'll also tell you that I've only been there for three months and we have a lot of things that, that, and the weird thing, I mean, we have been able to kind of do things over the past week that I've thought would take me two years. So today we're moving forward with purchasing virtual desktop um, for horizon view. We've got Respondus was set up last week. We had got Intelliboard, we'll go, we'll go actually went live on Wednesday and we're using poll everywhere in addition. So, you know, I've made my little, I've made my little sheet last <laughs> night just because I'm a nerd, um, but just to kind of show where we're going. And it's been, I just looked online and there's uh, currently there is a hundred and, and I'm sorry, there's 50 meetings going on currently. Um, so I'm giving dashboard reports for our president. So he can't walk around, our executives can't walk around, but at least I can show them that people are engaging and Teleboard is going to be used so that we can show that not only our students are engaging, but also our faculty are engaging. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, I'm just really trying to, I love baseball, so it's my Field of Dreams analogy that I always use, that I'm here to put that field in the middle of Iowa and let the faculty come and play. 
So my job is to get as many tools there for our faculty to go ahead and use. Um, and it's been, I think, very, very successful. We haven't skipped a beat. And especially we had our ninth day of class, which in the quarter system is, you all know, that's the big day of when your funding model, what your fund, who, how many students you're gonna have for funding. Yeah. So we passed that. We're also in the middle of moving to work day, not kidding. We oh, have an old mainframe that we have to have people there, operators that are there oh. to run operations. To, oh, tell me about it. Oh. So they come in, we have our campuses, you know, essential, essential people only. And we have people in there going in there, making sure that we can run payroll, making sure that we can get checks out. Um, so, you know, every, I mean, it's it's been, I think, a great experience. It's also been, you know, like I said, it, it's been a dream to see all these tools. These are all things that I've always wanted to put together, but I haven't been had necessarily, this is going to sound really horrible, but I, I haven't had to go through a governance at all. I basically just had to work very closely with my president, right. very closely with my provost, Right. And I'm in the meetings with all the deans and advocate and go. We had media site. We had Echo 360. We had a campus wide for Echo, for a media site. So what I did, we went at media site campus wide. There was no kind of discussion because we didn't have that kind of time. Now we are now I'm starting to develop surveys to go back and look best practices. How do we improve? Um, I'm, we did all we taped a bunch of these trainings that I talked about over the weekend. Next week, we're going to go and offer these trainings via Zoom live because we didn't have all the connections we didn't have all the ltis built, built together so now we're trying to basically go back and improve our processes it's been from a from a, a cio perspective it's been amazing to see the creativity in my staff hmm. it's also been amazing to see who rises to the occasion being a new cio there and who kind of just hangs around but it's that's been truly remarkable and this is an experience that I would never have been gotten. I mean, I'm. This is horrible to say. I've, I would never have gotten this experience, but through this opportunity, and I think it's going to forever change our campus. And I think it's going to. We wanted to move online. All the tools are there because everything automatically goes into uh, into Zoom now. So we have that tool set. So for me, the yeah. dashboards and the reports and being able to work closely with the deans and be. I mean, that's been. Uh, amazing to develop those relationships and also through a shared experience of us. I mean, you all know when you go through crisis, you yeah. come together, you get to know people differently and better. So I think it's going to forever change our campus and it's going to think forever change the way IT is viewed because honestly, uh. if these classes hadn't happened, and this is actually what I'm working my dissertation on, so I'll be reaching out to you a lot more on this, Brian, but Good. Um, if this hadn't happened, and we hadn't been able to go online, we potentially would have, if we would have had to take a time off or a break or a new spring break, students yeah. would have dropped. Students dropping means less money. We're a public institution yeah. and it cascades. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not gonna talk about Superman, but I'm gonna talk about that. If we hadn't done this, the potential would have been cast catastrophic for the university. Hang, hang on a second. Let me, let me pause you just for a second. Yes. Uh, I would love to talk about Louisiana politics, but let me, let me hold that for a second. <laughs> Ray, Ray, what do you want to ask uh, uh, Tom? I mean, he's gone through this work, three months of just absolute madness. What, what do you want to ask him about? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is that you have like a triage situation with your technology. And I'm just wondering how you're prioritizing, you know, Zoom, I guess, is the first first thing. And then um, how, how do you decide what to do next? The big focus was really focusing on keeping us being able to deliver our classes and being able to honestly have it so it's a good presentation for our students so they stay enrolled. That was that was the big the big focus for me was how do we get the tools in our faculty members' hands so that we can continue teaching? And then adding these other things like resp uh, respondents. I don't remember I said respondents. We're bringing us respondents online and that's for the test taking. So it's kind of an evolution of we're just simply adding all academic tools um, and those tools also happen to be, you know, tools that help with, with, um, with administrative. I mean, we're using, we're doing teletherapy with Zoom now. We're doing our counseling with Zoom. We're doing tutoring with Zoom. We're doing exercise programs with Zoom. So that the focus though was on the academic because at the end of the day, I'm really, really like that phrase, but at the end of the day, 
you know, we are an educational facility and that's what the focus has to be. Um, but that was the real, the real focus was first day of the quarter, we got to go now. And the staff is, I mean, yes, <clears throat> working late at night and the staff's really stepped, on, uh, stepped up and done that. We've been creative. We have a, one of the things we love, we've got Slack. So fire, we have an online going, going online group and we're any message. Basically I can ask anything. Anyone can ask anyone else within seconds. We're also blessed to have some students that didn't go home, especially some of our international students that work on our help desk. We're routing our help desk for calls to their dorm room so they can answer the calls. We're utilizing wow. student workers that were in an exercise facility that now don't have any place to go. They're coming and work in our library. We have a, we're a rural place here, so we left part our main floor of our library open because some of our faculty members have to come to campus to teach. Some of our students have to come to campus because they don't have a computer or because they don't have connectivity at their house. So for me, it was all about academics and giving those tools because if we don't teach classes, I'm not gonna, I mean, that's, that's, that's what we have to do. Correct. Good question. Um, and Tom, thank you so much for, for sharing your story. Um, I mean, this is an extraordinary time and my best to your staff as I go through this process. Uh, we have tons of questions and comments. Uh, and I, I also wanted to bring up to the stage um, uh, a truly remarkable professor. Uh, this is Kevin Gannon from Grandview University. Some of you might know him under the nom de plume, the tattooed prof. Um, Kevin is a historian who's also the director of their uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, Professor Geddon, good to see you. Brian, good to see you. How are you? All right, all right. Um, I'm really glad you could make it. And um, I, I thought about saying that we should continue this conversation in death metal voices, but then I, I held back. <laughs> I thought Rhea might just not believe she was hearing this. Um, one quick question for you is, um, you know, looking at the at the huge technological change that you're seeing happening both at your campus and, and around, uh, what are the leading technologies that people are using, just as a matter of choice? So at, at my institution at, at Grandview here in Des Moines, uh, in the middle of Iowa, so we are building it to, to go back to, to the can. field of <laughs> dreams illusion. Um, most, you know, our campus is still open, quote unquote, um, but classes have all moved to remote. Uh, most of our staffing is remote. You know, it's kind of that essential personnel only thing. Um, we offer a few programs online, but a majority of our instruction and mission is centered around traditional face-to-face -face pedagogy. Uh, so for us, the technology piece is basically, for many of our faculty, uh, use what you know. Mm. Uh, start small, you know, the simplest tool is often the best. Uh, so, you know, if I've got it, you know, in, in, in my teaching center, uh, my instructional technologist and I have been responsible for sort of coordinating this pivot. Um, which has been fun. Uh, but, you know, we've been working with faculty with a wide range of experiences. And so we have some faculty who have never even used our learning management system uh, and rarely email, right? And then we have other faculty who are power users of pretty much any digital tool that we have out there that we support. Mm -hmm. um, so the hardest part has been trying to meet people where they are. Um, one of the, so, you know, the the typical, I think, solution package, if you will, for, for folks who are, you know, were really anxious about this. And we had our spring break uh, to do this pivot. Um, Zoom is a big one. Uh, we also use Panopto um, mm -hmm. and integrating through Blackboard. Uh, for us, that's been huge uh, because that's allowing a lot of our faculty to, you know, sort of put content up and then use other tools to engage with it and discuss with students. Um, those are the two big, and then just, you know, LMS, uh, OneDrive, uh, Google Docs, you know, simple ways to collaborate and share. And and what we're finding is that the simplest tools are often the best for folks who are making this transition under less than ideal circumstances. Well, that's a great outline. That's a great outline. Um, Rhea, would you like to um, um, press Professor Gannon a bit more on some of this? Or have I terrified you too much? No, no. Uh, and so I've been thinking, you know, we've talked a lot about training faculty, um, but what about students? Are they having any trouble transitioning to these, are these tools new to them? 
Uh, yeah, actually. And that's one of the, I think one of the underappreciated parts of this whole equation as we talk about, and certainly, you know, as a faculty developer, a lot of my conversations have been about how do we get faculty ready for this? Uh, but we can't, just, you know, and it's been said ad nauseum, right? But we can't assume that students are familiar with these types of digital tools. Uh, students are consumers of digital tools in a lot of ways, but not necessarily things like Zoom, for example. Uh, and so I think some of us kind of got into a little bit of trouble when we assumed that students would immediately figure out Zoom uh, and be able to get into class. Um, I think for my institution and a lot who are like us, you know, we serve uh, populations that have long been underserved in higher education. About 60% of our students are first generation. Mm. Um, we serve a lot of students um, who are from the lowest quartile socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about things like the digital divide, access to broadband. Um, I've been emailing with one of my students who's stuck back home in the Dominican Republic uh, who can send oh. email once in a while, but that's about it. Oh. So Zoom is kind of out of the question, right? And so what we've been trying to do is put together resources for students, brief tutorial videos, stuff that faculty can put right in front of them uh, to help walk through. We've been doing a lot of screenshotted, uh, you know, kind of tip sheets and emails. But then the other thing that we've been doing is trying to help faculty come up with ways to do quick surveys and check-ins with their students to see who's got access to what. Are some students still on campus? Because that's going to make a difference in terms of broadband. And if you're at home, what kind of connection do you have? What kind of device do you have? One of the things that we've really been struggling with is, you know, we had a lot of faculty who just sort of assumed that, yeah, we'll just hold classes online, right? You know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 150, here we are. And that works when, in a normal circumstance, on my 85% residential campus. Right. But when people are home, and different needs, maybe different job needs, caregiving needs. We've come to discover that, you know, some of our students really appreciate having a synchronous meeting option, but a lot of them can't make it. Uh, so figuring out how to strike that balance, use recordings, uh, and certainly don't make it so that students who can't make it to a synchronous session are being penalized in any way. Um, so from the student perspective, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's almost as many questions as there are students, right? And so having our faculty think about things from a more empathetic, much more flexible perspective maybe than we're often used to. Yeah. Um, that's been kind of our first rule of thumb. Nice. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah. The, and, and thank you, Ray, for the great question. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, let me keep uh, both of you here as our expert panel. Um, and uh, let me bring up some more questions that have popped up um, as we've been talking. Um, oh, just one quick question for me, uh, Kevin. What's a uh, What's the ratio of your um, academic technology, instructional technology, instructional designer staff to the number of faculty at your campus? So we have about 95 full-time faculty, uh, about 150 to 180 adjunct faculty. We have one part-time instructional designer who works remotely. We have an instructional technologist slash LMS administrator who works out of my teaching center, and we have me. Okay. So one to 25 or one to 50 or so, depending on how you count it. We've been busy, yeah. Ray, is that what you've been seeing um, around the country as well, that kind of ratio or? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I guess it it varies, um, but I think everyone's being hard hit by all the all the questions of how to do this move online or, or just any sort of continuity of, of instruction. I hear that, I hear that. Um, well, let's, let's look ahead a little bit. We have a question from uh, the uh, awesome uh, Professor Mark Rush at Washington Lee, who asks, what is the possibility of having to continue at least partially online in September? And also possible some international students won't be able to return due to travel restrictions. So what do you two guys think about that? I think we need to prepare for that possibility. Um, we already are in, in my teaching center. Um, you know, in Iowa, we have not been issued a shelter in place order, even though the pressure is intensifying on our governor to do that. But I think it's becoming more aware as we talk about what's necessary for public health that this is a, a fairly slow moving thing, right? Um, so we've already been kind of mad dash planning for our summer sessions, um, which for us are really important for our revenue uh, and our yearly operating budget. And those are certainly gonna have to be moved fully online. Mm -hmm. um, and we actually start our summer in the first week of May. Our spring, our spring semester ends the last week of April. So this is coming up quick for us. 
um, international students. We have a significant portion of international students at my institution. And yeah, we've, I mean, a lot of them are stuck where they went for spring break. Uh, you know, I mentioned my student in the Dominican Republic, for example, we have students in Europe, we have students in Asia and Oceania, uh, and we have students wow. in the Caribbean uh, who haven't been able to get back now. And so we've been, you know, we need to think about what that's going to look like for the fall, because I think it's a, a pretty high probability. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Oh. Uh, Mark, thank you for that great question. And uh, um, Kevin, I mean, really, that's we're not just thinking about a one week transition here I and mean, we're talking about the long haul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm supposed to be the guy who talks about hope and things like that. Um, but I think, you know, we are, this is unprecedented and as comforting as it is to think of it as temporary. And I think temporary, it, it, it still is temporary, just not maybe as yeah. short term temporary as we think. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think what we've already learned from this sort of crash course and moving online um, is that the more we're able to plan for these things and, you know, game out scenarios, the, the better prepared we're going to be when the need arises. And so for that reason alone, I think we need to be thinking about the fall semester in these terms. Now that brings up another question of admissions and, you know, uh, what happens with incoming freshmen or even just trying to recruit students and give them tours of the campus and, and things. Yeah, we're doing virtual visits and virtual admissions tours. Um, it's, and I'll tell you, you know, for small institutions like mine, the ones who are really dependent on enrollment and tuition for our revenue, yeah. uh, this is going to be really difficult. You know, we're already looking at, you know, what's our recruiting targets? Where are we in the admissions funnel? What do our numbers look like in our past five-year cycle? Things like that. Um, Every school like mine is sweating over these uh, those numbers right now, uh, and that's one of the really scary parts. Is you know this is for schools that are already, you know, tightening their belts even under the best of circumstances. This this is a problem. Well, hang in there, hang in there, and 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 don't go away for a sec. We had a couple of questions that came up that uh, speak to some of the points that we've just touched on. Uh, this is one from uh, Kadiyun, uh, who just observes, for time zones, we have students in China and the West Coast, so 15-hour time difference. Mm. So tolling class at a common time we could all agree to is is difficult. Uh, yes. so that may be another reason to push for um, uh, you know, asynchronous, uh, more asynchronous teaching, including recordings. Um, we have um, uh, uh, Dave Ron wants to uh, just switch machines. Let's see if we can bring him up on stage. Let's see how this goes. Let's see, uh, maybe a broadband issue there. Dave, can we see you? No, Dave, I, th I think that's your connection. Um, uh, why don't you uh, try again by just typing in a question or a comment, and then I'll relay that to everybody else. Uh, we also have a question from, uh, a very detailed question from Christopher Dobson at uh, Harper College. Let me bring this up. This is a complex one. Um, he asks, how do we get more faculty to consider moving to more micro learning or flipped resources with online Q&A questions or online Q&A sessions? That's a great question. If anyone knows the answer, please email me. <laughs> that's the, you know, we've been doing, a, I, I think, and again, speaking just from the experience working with the, the community of colleagues that I have, you know, we talk a lot about resistance to change and things like that. And I think that's part, of, but I, you know, for faculty, I think what it is, is it's not that people are inherently against these things. It's this, they're so abstract in some people's mind as to not know what those look like. So when we say what, you know, why don't we move to micro learning? Why don't we move to, you know, flipping parts of your course? In principle, sure, but what does that look like in Psych 101? You know, what does that look like in Biology 101? And so I think the way that we have these conversations constructively is to work with faculty members and say, this is what it could look like. You know, here's an example of, of something that would, that would likely work in your situation. And so let's talk about, is this a good thing for student learning? Is this a good thing for student engagement? The more specific I am, with faculty members and the more I'm able to actually demo things concretely, mm -hmm. um, the less barriers there are in the way to adopting what would be pretty significant changes to one's pedagogy. Mm. 
Kevin, it's great to have you here for the faculty perspective in particular. Um, just to, that's a really, really good point. That's very, very wise. Uh, if, uh, Christopher, if we don't, if we haven't given you a, a, a good enough uh, handle on that, uh, why don't you come back at us with another question or drill down into one of those and we'll see if we can flesh it out a bit. Uh, Rhea, did you want to try pouncing on that one? Um, it just seems to me that, you know, maybe most people are in sort of the stage one of just simply trying to keep the classes going. And then stage two is, okay, how can we fine tune this and, you know, actually do it better? Oh, that's a good way of putting it. That's a good way of putting it. Thank you. And Rhea, your, your use of the term stage actually brings up something I think is really important. And it may be sort of cliche to say this because it's been all over social media, but if you use the Kubler-Ross model of stages of grief, oh, no. right? <laughs> I mean, this, I, I honest, this is where we are in my institution. We were in denial for a little bit. Like, are we going to have to do this? Right. And we lost some time, right? And then, you know, we moved into anger. We moved into bargaining. And But I think what's important is, is think of our students who are supposed to graduate this year. Yeah. Right. Think of our student athletes whose career just came to an end. Um, think of faculty whose classes were going really well. You know, maybe that small seminar, or that upper level lab course. And now there's this. I mean, I do think that there are stages to this. And right now we're in that stage of just, you know, I think some of my colleagues just still mourning the loss of this thing that they shared with their students that we share with our students. And and I think we have to make allowances for that. Um, in terms of what kind of bandwidth folks have for thinking about these larger issues. Uh, I think that's right. I, um, when I took my seminar online, my students were unusually quiet um, to begin with. And uh, I real I thought they were awkward with the technology. They didn't make sense because they were very comfortable normally. And then I realized that they were, they were in mourning and, and mm -hmm. it was partly the, the face to face environment that, that we'd enjoyed. But I think also connected the broader mourning of, you know, not being able to go to the, your favorite restaurant, not being able to just you know go for a hike and talk to people, um, you know, social distancing is uh, especially for we extroverts uh, is a, a hard thing to do. Um, Absolutely. We have a quick note I just wanted to share from uh, Baynard, uh, who apparently has more time than than any human should. Uh, he just quickly made an hour ago um, a quick page on on how to do remote read remote recordings. Uh, so Baynard, thank you very much. Uh, I'll share that on uh, on Twitter too. Um, much obliged to see those resources. Um, we have a quick question um, to uh, turn to the international topic uh, from uh, Charles Findlay at Northeastern, who wonders if international students will be allowed to return, or if visas will not be granted. Uh, Rhea, have you have you been seeing any uh, any sign of this uh, in your coverage so far? Hmm. Um, honestly, I don't know. Um, I, I imagine it's just kind of a big unknown for everyone. Um, and as Kevin, uh, you're, I mean, you mentioned some of your students are from the DR and from Oceania. Um, what are your thoughts on this? This worries me a lot um, because what I'm seeing, and you know, I should point out that that I'm a historian of race and racisms in U.S. history, and so what I'm seeing here kind of evokes some of the kind of xenophobic responses to external threats that the U.S. has had before. And I fear that, given the drift of current, you know, the the current administration, um, yeah. it's going to make it really difficult for our international students. And so I think this is one of those for those of us who are involved in higher education. Um, you know, this upcoming election is going to matter a lot for obviously a variety of reasons, but this is one that specifically impacts us. I, you know, I think that we're, our international students had already been struggling with visa issues this year, at least at my institution, sure. even if it was in terms of just, you know, administ increased administrative burdens or delay in the process. Um, so I know one of the things that we need to be doing and that I would recommend everybody doing at their institution is, you know, making sure that your international studies coordinator or whatever office oversees that um, is making plans uh, for what to do in terms of, you know, an increased burden in the fall. Mm. Uh, speaking, speaking of which, uh, we had a question from Mark Rush before, but let me just share his follow-up comment. He's the director of the Center for International Education at Washington. Mm -hmm. He says the visa issue is a real problem. Regular visa processing has been suspended for a while. 
so it looks like this is going to be a, a, a big, big challenge. Yes. Let's uh, let's let's come back to the uh, technology issue. We have um, Dave Ron um, from uh, Cleveland has been pushing really hard to get on, and he's very patient. And I, I want to thank him for that. Uh, so he shared his question with text, which is. Our biggest challenge at the Tri-C's is our student body is significantly made up of low-income folks that have neither internet access at home or the computer equipment to use. Most of them expect to come to campus, now closed, to use school's devices. Um, and I, that's not a question so much as an observation about something that's uh, that's quite dire. And we've seen many, many examples of that. Uh, I'm just wondering, Rayo, what have you seen of uh, how colleges and universities have responded to this? Are you seeing them loaning out more uh, more laptops um, or tablets, or are they loaning out hotspots, or are they making some other arrangement? Um, well, just, I can just share like a personal experience with this, which is the main problem with our school district that you know my daughter goes to. Um, that they have not been able to offer any online learning because. Um, of the, you know, because not every student would be able to access it. And so it's been taking them extra time to figure out, I think their plan is, and it's crazy because I'm in Silicon Valley, you'd think we would be on this, um, but their plan is to send Chromebooks out preloaded with all of the right apps and everything to students at home. So they don't even have to come, you know, uh, to a campus to pick it up because, you know, social distance. Um, but you know, for the rest of us, it's kind of frustrating because we're left with nothing, <laughs> nothing to occupy, you know, our kids in the meantime. Um, oh no, no. A challenging situation. Oh, that's a good point. Oh gosh, good luck. <laughs> um, and if I hear an eight-year-old shriek, I'll understand. Com we'll always all understand completely. Um, by the way, if any of my cats have hurtled past me, please, that they're they're usually very show-offy. So, if one of them leaps over my shoulder onto my head, that'll That'll be why. Um, but uh, Kevin, have you have you seen any solutions to uh, the problem that Dave raises? No, I haven't. Um, and it's a problem that we're experiencing too with a lot of our students. Um, you know, some students, their internet access is through a phone with maybe a limited data plan and that's it if they're not on campus, right? And so we've been trying to meet as best we can, you know, loaning out laptops that we do have, uh, trying to find surplus machines that we can get in the hands of students. Um, but it, our efforts are incomplete at best. Um, and most schools like us who aren't that well resourced, I think that's the case too. I think one of the things as we think about what comes out the other side of this is, you know, we do a lot of talking about the digital divide. And I think intellectually, we've always thought about what that means. But I think this is a real visceral uh, sort of demonstration of what that does mean for our students when there is not a campus option uh, for access. Uh, I know one of the things we've been talking about at Grandview, because we've been making a big push to move to OERs, is you know we can have all the great digital tools we want, but if our students can't access them and they're not on campus, then they're useless. And so one of our conversations is, why don't we just give everybody a Chromebook when they show up, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so mm -hmm. I, I think we're gonna have to start looking, even at schools like mine, you know, which is a 1600 student private college, you know, in the middle of Des Moines, Iowa, um, you know, we're talking about things that normally you would associate with larger state university systems. But I think that what, what we're doing now has really demonstrated the need for closing that digital divide as much as we can. Have you, uh, I mean, uh, American historians are people I love to pick on for current events, which is almost never a good idea, but let me just give this a try. Um, have you seen anything in the uh, Senate bill that uh, passed today that indicates spending on uh, digital infrastructure? I have just glanced over the executive summary of the legislation, so I'm not sure. My immediate thoughts on it are that it's not enough. Um, you know, we're talking, you know, this should be New Deal on steroids stuff, especially given the unemployment numbers that came across the wires this morning. Um, there is higher ed funding in there. I haven't seen anything other than it's just there. Um, so how that's used and how that's distributed, I think, is going to be really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's in, you know, and again, we're in this climate where funding has already been eviscerated for, in some cases, the last four decades. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, if this is if this is the stimulus, there needs to be more. Good point. Um, and we'll be looking at that uh, at that bill, especially if 
when the final bill gets passed through the House, as I'm by the White House. Uh, friends, let me just remind you, we are 10 minutes from the end. Somehow 50 minutes have disappeared in the blink of an eye. Uh, so we would love to hear more of your thoughts and your questions. Uh, we have a few more in the queue, but I just want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to share your experience of uh, managing or working, teaching, being taught. If there are topics that we haven't addressed, such as grading, such as teacher evaluations, such as uh, which LMS to use or tactics of video, uh, please either click the raised hand button to join us on stage. You see how we can do this here or just type it in the question box and, and we can raise it um, along those lines. Um, we have a, a quick note here uh, from a Katayun who mentions that publishers and companies that have made things freely available if you have a laptop or internet and free wireless is being offered by some companies and data plans for free for two months from Comcast. So those are some things from the private sector, uh, which is good to know. Uh, and folks, uh, Kevin mentioned OER. If, if you're new to the term, it's just open education resources. Um, Brea, what have you what have you been seeing in this great great transition that um, uh, we haven't touched on so far in terms of technology? Um, uh, well, a big one I haven't talked about yet is accessibility. You know, and um, we're t doing more videos, and you know, there's the whole captioning aspect and making sure you know people who are blind or deaf or have other you know. Uh, uh, issues, you know, how how can we tackle that problem? Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Uh, I was just on a webinar with uh, Educuds and people were diving into this in great detail. Uh, one school that had a pretty substantial uh, accessibility office um, described, you know, they're going to a great deal of, of effort to put in captioning, to put in uh, alt tags for images and to really push for transcripts. Um, and anyway, that's that's one start. Uh, Stephen Downs, um, the fantastic uh, researcher, innovator, blogger from, uh, uh, from Canada, has said that he actually wants us to push more towards audio and less uh, video, um, because among other things, audio is easier to uh, turn into accessibility. The visually impaired can hear it, and it's easier to turn into uh, into text. And if anybody um, anybody uh, in this conversation has had any experience with uh, rolling this out. Um, please uh, either you know, raise your hand um, or uh, type it in the chat box and, and we'd, we'd love to hear from you. Let me add uh, one more uh, question or one more topic to the mix. Uh, and this is from uh, one of your colleagues um, at uh, Campus Technology. Um, whoop, question just went away. Um, uh, Diane uh, Schaffhausen, if you could just share the, oh, there it is. Let me bring it up on the screen. Uh, this is from Dan Schaff, uh, Schaffhauser at uh, Campus Tech, and she asks for you, Kevin. Are you seeing signs that faculty are jumping on the professional learning resources you're providing, or are they just stumbling along on their own? Oh, they've been they've been jumping on them for sure. Um, so even though we were on spring break last week, my technologist and I scheduled individual consultations and held several different workshops, both in person and virtually as well, and those were all well attended. You know, we've been hopping, um, whether it's on Zoom, phone chats, or in person at the appropriate social distance, of course, um, to get everybody ready. Um, it's so at my institution, but my institution is also, you know, our culture is very strong, you know, student centered, pro teaching. You know, that's, we really have that woven into our ethos. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, but what I'm hearing from folks and through faculty development networks, especially at the, in with my smaller college colleagues, is that it's fairly, fairly consistent that faculty are, you know, hungry for these resources, taking advantage of them, don't want to be stumbling along by themselves because mm -hmm. even, you know, regardless of what one's position is on online learning or comfort with technology, you know, faculty members do care about their students and their students' success. And so if this is the hand that we have to play to, you know, if even if it's the least worst option, you know, whatever we can provide for support uh, is being utilized. And so I've seen that, you know, happen in pretty robust ways, at least in the areas that I'm familiar with. Good. And coming back to that, it's kind of ethos of care. Um, mm -hmm. uh, let me just share quickly a couple of uh, comments that people made that relate to what we've just been talking about. Uh, John uh, Sheehan um, notes, uh, an article I read today stated there is $14 billion in funding for higher ed and stimulus package. Thank you, John. That's $14 billion that we didn't have. That's good to know. Right. 
Uh, and then Mark Rush uh, comes back uh, about the State Department. He shares a link about the suspension of consular services. Um, so mm -hmm. you guys can follow that if you'd like to get uh, updated information from the very source itself. Uh, Kevin, I, I had a, a technology question that strikes at um, at your work in several different levels. Mm -hmm. um, you and many others have been observing uh, that the practical use of digital technology is often biased um, by certain key ways, especially by race, especially mm -hmm. by gender, especially by sexual identity. And I'm wondering, what can we do right now in this transition to make sure that such biases do not recur? Uh, I'm thinking, for example, of um, a bit of a flurry of stories about Zoom, uh, where people have been Zoom bombing, mm -hmm. uh, often with abusive uh, intent. Um, and I I'm wondering, what, how can people who are shepherding this great transition try to avoid repeating these terrible mm -hmm. patterns? Well, you know, the, so there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Um, I think a few thoughts that immediately come to mind is first, we, you know, we need to be very mindful of the tools that we're using and why we're using those tools. So if I'm using Zoom, how is this advancing the goals for my course? How is this advancing my, my uh, student learning goals, for example? And how do I use these tools mindfully enough, i.e., trigger the options so nobody can just randomly share a desktop, for example, and Zoom bomb you. Um, we need to be aware of, you know, what's baked into the cake with these tools as well. And I think that goes to a larger, you know, thing. When we think about, you know, what are our assumptions about students and about learners? And so one of the frustrating things that I've been seeing is that, you know, the assumption is, is now that we're online, students are just going to cheat. And so we need to get things like Respondus and Proctor U and all of these things, because now that we're online, you know, it's going to be the Wild West and, you know, students will just be on their phones taking these tests. And, you know, I think we need to sort of pump the brakes here and realize that we're telling ourselves a story about how students are going to behave in an online environment right. that doesn't necessarily comport with the research that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the tools that we're using, we should be asking ourselves, you know, why are we using them? Is it because of a narrative that we bought into about students or is it because of something that's actually a problem? Um, so I don't think the great online cheating wave is going to happen anytime soon. You know, all the research I've seen suggests that rates of academic dishonesty and online and face-to-face -face classes are pretty much similar, you know, no statistically yeah. significant difference. Yeah. So the same things that we do in terms of thinking about assignment design, course design, um, you know, to mitigate dishonesty in our face-to-face -face courses, we should be doing in online courses as well. So I think the larger, you know, to, to, to try to circle back to your question here, I think the, larger, the largest consideration we need to have is, what is our narrative about students and learning in this environment? And how is that shaping the decisions that we make about what tools we want to use, as well as what tools we choose not to use? Mm. That's a great, great way to frame this. Thank you. Um, Brea, uh, only if you have a, a, as we come really close to the end of the hour, I'm wondering what kind of big question you have to ask at the end. Well, here's something maybe to end on a, an upbeat note. Um, do you see any silver lining to all of this, you know, whether it's how people have come together in a crisis or the way, you know, we're using more tech tools that will impact courses when we get back to normal? Um, what do you think? Well, Kevin, why don't you lead off? Go back to hope. Yeah, I do. I, this is, you know, the silver lining such as it is, is that, you know, we have an opportunity to really remake a lot of things and maybe get them right. Um, when people say, let's go back to the way things were, you know, my rejoinder to that was, let's go back things to the way that things ought to have been. Mm. Uh, so mm. as we think very deeply about student learning and about the ways that we educate and about the very decisions we make in terms of teaching and learning, you know, we're forced to do that by these circumstances, but the fact that we are doing it, I think gives us a chance to really think about possibilities, solutions, opportunities, and in particular, addressing the inequities that this crisis has laid there. Oh, that's beautifully said. It's almost an alternate history perspective. Um, Ray, history uh, and its choices. That's, that's what it comes down to, right? What choices sure. have we made? Um, Ray, I, I have several ideas for silver lining. Uh, one is that uh, we're getting a lot of experience in a hurry. Um, and that's a tremendous amount of learning that's happening. And it's great to see academic institutions working as learning institutions uh, where we're doing lifelong learning um, as we go. And that's tremendous. That's a lot of growth. Um, and it's going to be a lot of data. 
I mean, there's going to be a lot of great research done on this. I mean, Kevin, you were mentioning, you know, the rates of cheating face-to-face -face versus online, you know, thinking about tracing out all kinds of questions of achievement and by, I mean, all kinds of good stuff. Um, so that's one that I think is uh, is a bit of a silver lining. The second is, uh, I'll go back to um, what uh, Thomas said, the uh, CIO at, at Louisiana Tech, and he mentioned that this was a great bonding experience for his team. And I'm thinking this is true both of technology enterprises, you know, campus IT This is a great time for people to be really innovative and to try a lot of really exciting things. Um, what a great question. Thank you, Raya. Thank you. Uh, it's it's the top of the hour, and I have to thank both of you, um, uh, Kevin Gannon of Grandview University and Raya Kelly of Campus Technology. Thank you for being up here and co-hosting and batting ideas around and taking questions seriously. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for inviting me. And Raya, it was good to be up here with you. Yeah, this is great. Thanks so much. Oh, it's a real pleasure. Let me just ask for everybody, um, how do we keep up with you two? What are the best ways? So I'm on Twitter, uh, at the Tattooed Prof is where you can find me, or you can just Google me uh, on the internet um, because that's where I yell a lot. So <laughs> I'm pretty easy to track down. But yeah, please do feel free to, to pop onto one of those locations and say, hey, Excellent. Yeah, and for me, campustechnology.com, we have, you know, a contact us page. You can find me there. Um, yeah, send me an email. <laughs> we will, we will. And thank you to Campus Technology for partnering with us on this. I hope we can do this again. Me too. Uh, well, before everyone goes, uh, let me just quickly say uh, thank you all for your questions, your comments, your attention. Uh, these are all fantastic, and I'm really glad of your time and sharing this. We're living through an extraordinary moment, and I'm glad to be living through it with all of you. Uh, next week, we're going to continue this focus on COVID-19. We'll see what happens between now and then. Uh, we'll see how this develops. Now, if you want to keep talking about this, uh, if you want to continue these questions about everything from grading to supporting students to the digital divide, we have many, many venues for doing that, including uh, through social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Slack. Uh, if you'd also like to dive back into the past and look at our previous uh, you know, five years worth of uh, sessions, we have a whole stack of uh, archive videos that are available for you at any time. Um, and in the meantime, please everyone keep thinking, sharing your stories about this, helping each other out, and be safe, remain uninfected, keep the social distancing going. I'd love to hear from all of you. And again, thank you so much for your participation. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>